It's been a long time. Shouldn't have left you, left you without a dope beat. The step two, step two, step two, step two, step two, step two, step two. <laughs> Oh, I'm just having a little fun, but that's how I feel today. You know, I feel like it's been a long time since I put out an episode for you guys. And I just, um, I'm so glad to be back. And um, I thank you for tuning in, for being back with me. You know, life happens sometimes and uh, the things we'd like to be doing, we don't always get to put that kind of time into it. So, you know, I'm no different. Life happens. And um, the, at least the good thing about that, that even though um, we go through things and experiences, we can still learn from those. And so with everything that I'm learning along my journey, I'm happy to share with you. And so we've got a lot of good episodes ready to go. It is almost Valentine's Day. And with that, you know, I'll be the first to admit, I'm not a big fan of Valentine's Day. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I'm not. But it is a good time in which people, they show love and affection to that special someone and all the special someones in your life, right? It's a time to have those grand romantic gestures, the flowers, the candy, the teddy bears, the cards, all that good stuff. And with all that in mind, I think about God's love and how do we really experience and interact with God's love. So with that in mind, I have this episode, y'all. It's called Love Without a Limit. And I'm kind of playing off my girl, Mary J. Blige. You know, she had that song back in the day, Love No Limit. And so we're, we're just talking about God's love because it has no limit. You know, he, um, he has a, a limitless agape love that is not based on condition. And we're going to get more into that in a minute. Before I do... Let's just get into it, y'all. Let's hit that theme song. Let's go. <sighs> Ooh, it feels good to be back. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about a love that has no limit. And the only love I know like that is God's love. You know, people will change on you. I don't even have to tell you that. You know it. People, their love sometimes, even if they're not intentionally doing it, love from person to person can sometimes be conditional. And, you know, you, you get your heart broken because you might have expectations of someone and they let you down. They fall short of those expectations. And maybe you learn that the person you thought you had isn't really who they presented in the beginning or maybe just who you thought they were and you know relationships among people change and like I said people hurt us people they leave you know they they do things that break our heart but God is consistent God does not change and I feel like that is a hard concept to wrap your head around when all you know is that person to person love it, you know and we could talk about the Greek different names for love where there's like the filios where it's friendship but how many of you know like friendships end over silly stuff like arguments or you know money exchanged hands folks didn't say what they were going to do they didn't do what they said they were going to do rather and um, friendships end you know or just people grow apart and then you have eros which is that romantic love that's where we get the term erotic from but it has to do with romantic, like sexual love. And with that, boy, I mean, there are whole books and movies and television shows about that kind of love and how it can go sideways so fast, right? And then you have the familial love where it's like a mother to a child and a father to a child and I'll say that is probably the purest love we have. And even though that can go wrong sometimes, a mother to a child might be the closest thing we have to God's kind of love because it is a sacrificial love. I mean, you think about a mother who, first of all, is the host for this, this, new, this unborn child for nine months and all the sacrifice that goes into that, those sleepless nights and the heartburn and the 
the trips to the bathroom, the weight gain. I mean, it goes on and on and the morning sickness, you know. Um, but then even after that child is born, you have this um, this woman who said, like, first of all, she labored and that's pain. And I've been through it three times myself. That's no joke. <laughs> but then you, the sleepless nights and just watching this child grow and helping them along their way for 18 years. And some moms will attest that it, it takes longer than 18 years sometimes for our kids to figure it out. So that mother to child love seems to be the closest thing we have to what God's kind of love looks like. And I'll say too, that a lot of times when people have had broken relationships with their family members, that's when you start to see a distrust of God and um, a, a, a rejection of Christianity. Because here we are presenting a God who loves you no matter what, who is always going to protect you, guide you, love you, provide for you. And if all we have is the familial relationship to, to sort of connect with, to see what that looks like, and that has been broken and damaged, how much harder is it to love a God you can't even see and, and expect that he's going to do those things for you when even your earthly mother or father didn't do that? And so, boy, you know, it's deep. Those relationship hurts are deep. And so, like, I have, I've, I've come to understand that you can't really teach someone about God's love. There is nothing I can say in this video that's going to be like, oh, light bulb, God loves me. You can know it intellectually. And I hear what I'm saying. You can know that God loves you intellectually. But the only way you know that you know that you know without a shadow of a doubt and you will not waver off that thing, that doesn't come until you experience God's love for yourself. There's, there's just no way I can teach you that God loves you. I can teach you what you can know about God, but until you experience it for yourself, it doesn't become real. And um, I remember being a young person and, and I've, I've been in church pretty much my whole life, I say, but I didn't get really turned on to the Lord and wanted to, to profess my faith until the age of about 12 or 13. So about that time, Oh, where was I going with this? Okay, so growing up in church, there was always a term that we were either like afraid of becoming or we were living it. And it's called backsliding. We were always afraid of like, oh, we don't want to backslide. No, no, no. We we in this. We 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 are committed and we love God. But there were those people that we would hear kind of whispers about. Not that I went to a gossiping church, but you know, you go, oh, what, where has so-and-so been? I haven't seen them in a while. And so um, what you'll hear is like, oh, backsliding is basically when a person, you know, let's say it's wintertime, it's cold outside, right? And they coming into church. I'm just joking about it being cold, like just needing a warm place to stay. But my, my, my point is, <laughs> bad joke, it didn't even work. Let's keep, let's keep moving on. <laughs> what I'm saying is it could be December and a person gets really turned on to God. And so they are at church and they are fully invested and they join the choir and they're there to volunteer. They help and serve the chicken after service. You know, they, they all in. And then three, four months go by. And then after a while, you don't see them. And then you hear that they went back to an old you know, broken relationship. I'm not even going to classify, but like you just hear they got into some stuff or they, you know, they going through it. You wouldn't hear exactly what it was, but like, let's say they going through it. So you don't see them for a while. And then when they really get rock bottom, they come back to church. You know, it's like a person might try to do things on their own and they struggle. And then when they, they can't struggle anymore, then they come back and they throw themselves at the altar, wanting the, the mercy of God and like this cycle happens in a lot of people's lives where, you know, when they really hit rock bottom and things get really rough, emotionally, they just wrecked and they don't know what else to do. They turn to God and they get really plugged into church. But as soon as they start to feel better, like life is starting to turn around, you know, and they give credit to God and they give a testimony and all that good stuff. But like when things start going well, then they taper off a little bit. It's like, okay, I got, I got my strength back. I'm gonna go back and fight this fight. 
and then God really just becomes an uh, like an option, you know, and like that's the best. That's basically the best way I can explain backsliding and how I've come to understand it. You also have like more extreme cases where people, you know, they have a drug addiction or maybe they've been in gangs their whole life. And that, that street life just keeps calling them back. And even though they want to be connected in fellowship with the Lord, that street life is stronger, you know. Well, what hope does a person like that have? And how do they stop backsliding? It really comes down to experiencing God's love. Now, I don't have an extreme testimony like that because... I I'll just I've been a goody goody my whole life. That, that that it is what it is. I've been like kind of on the straight and narrow for my whole life just because I you know first of all my mom was mean <laughs> and so as a kid I was just too scared to get in anything. But honestly, like I just knew I wanted different, so I really didn't get into a whole lot as a kid. But I do remember, and maybe a lot of you guys can connect with this. I remember the pressure I felt to get it right. I mean, come on, somebody. The pressure to uphold this standard that God has set for all of us. So I can't, I can, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not pleasing to God unless I'm doing the most, right? I got to attend every Bible study, every um, women's group. I got to uh, make sure I'm volunteering in at least one ministry. I got to make sure I'm giving my 10%. I got to make sure I'm giving my offering on top of the 10%. I got to help drive the church van on Sundays. And, you know, and the list goes on and on. And a lot of times the motivation isn't, I love God and I love his people. Let me be a blessing. The motivation is, I just want God to be pleased with me. And I'm going to tell you right now, Number one, that pressure, it's no wonder you might disappear from church for a month or two just to get a, a break, right? But also, too, God is not calling you to a life of like indentured servitude to him. He said that he gave us life to have it and have it more abundantly. We are called to have abundant life, to enjoy the life that he's given and it, I love another scripture that says he's given us all things freely to enjoy. He wants us to be happy in the things that we do. He wants us to enjoy this life and all that it has, not just your church service and the church events being the central focus of your life, but that you get out in the world and enjoy it. Enjoy a good plate of food with good company. Go travel, go see other places, go see other cultures, see how other folks do church. I know that's a taboo, ain't it, to go to somebody else's church on a Sunday. But that's all right. That's all right. The pressure that, and, and I'm going to do another episode on this, but it, it connects. Because the pressure we feel a lot of times to uphold God's standard and to be pleasing to him, that is not pressed upon us by God, but rather by man and sometimes by ourselves. We put that pressure on ourselves and we make faith and Christianity a burden when it's meant to be a blessing. It's not meant to be bondage. It's meant to be freedom. I, I hope you get what I'm saying. And the next thing I just want to drop on you is if love can't be taught, then how do you experience the love of God? Well, I'm glad you asked that question and you're in the right place because this is Ask Ronnie. By the way, before I answer that, have you subscribed yet to the podcast? It is available everywhere. So take a look, do a search. It's Ask Ronnie, A-S-K-R-H-O-N-N-I-E. I'll put a little um, whatever down below here. See that right there? See it? Okay. Yeah. So check us out and share with a friend because this is good, right? If it's good, let me know. <laughs> if it's not, let me know as well. All right. <laughs> talking about. If I can't teach you how to love God, then how do you experience the love of God? 
So I sat and I thought about it, prayed about it, and I came up with three keys for you, three takeaways for today. Number one, if you want to experience God's love, you got to spend time in his presence. You got to spend time with him. You know, meditation is often connected to um, like Eastern religions, you know, like yoga and meditation are kind of hand in hand. And um, some Christian circles just reject yoga and, and, and meditation altogether because they feel like that's new age. But meditation is something that I think all of us do, whether we realize it or not, because meditation is really just intense focus on something. So if you're meditating um, for peace, for example, the way uh, a Buddhist might, you are focusing on things that are calming and relaxing, or rather like you're focusing on not focusing on anything at all. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you're clearing your mind, if that's even possible. If you know how to do it, put something down in the comment because I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but if you can focus on nothing at all, then that would be like a, a way to, to, to gain balance and peace in, in, um, in a Buddhist culture. But everyone meditates on something, whether you realize it or not. Here's how I know. So let's say a friend of yours texts you like just in the middle of the day and said, OMG, I have something to tell you. And they do like a shocked face emoji but they tell you nothing else and you don't hear from them for the rest of the work day. And like, it's getting dark and you're like, oh my goodness, what could have happened? You're, you're running every scenario in your head from the, from the moment you read that text, hoping it's either an OMG in a good way or praying that it's not something worse, right? So whether you realize it or not, you have just meditated on that text message and what it could mean for a lot longer than you probably realize. For the whole day, you were wondering, what could that mean? That's meditation. Meditation can be in a positive direction. It can also be in a negative direction. A lot of us worry and we have fear and anxiety. And that is essentially a meditation on negative things. And how about, you know, because this is our Valentine's episode. You've got that special someone you've been thinking about, right? That's meditation too, boo. So you've been thinking about your honey, your bae, you know, and, and the things that you'd like to enjoy with them on Valentine's Day. That's meditation. So here's what I'm saying. Spending time in the presence of the Lord is a meditation as well. It's taking your understanding and knowledge of him and spending time in thought about that and I believe that that meditation leads to praise and adoration and appreciation. Hello, Jesse Jackson. But the adoration, appreciation, and meditation. <laughs> I'm just too silly today. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you hear what I'm saying. It is, it is a way to connect with God. It's to connect with the person of God and who he is in your life. And as you take time just to acknowledge him in all your ways, that's the blessing, right? That's what the scripture calls us to do, to acknowledge him in all our ways. He will direct our path. He will lead you into deeper fellowship with him as you actually take time for him. We can take time for anything. We take time for the gym. We take time to, um, you know, go out to eat with friends. We take time to uh, binge watch on Netflix, that kind of thing. No judgment. But I'm just saying we can take time for so many things in our lives that we deem important. So why not make that time with God important too? to etch out maybe 15 minutes? If, if you have, if you're, you know, if your schedule's really tight, can you give God 15 minutes just to sit and talk with him to acknowledge all the good that he did in your life that week, that day, you know? So that's how you start to experience his love is just by spending time with him. And so the next, the next point is to be transparent with him because as you're spending time with the Lord, we don't have time for fake. We just don't. When you're with your father, the creator, he knows your heart. He knows, he knows everything about you. So why put on the mask? That's the time where, you know, if you're hiding, like if you've got things that you're ashamed about 
or things that you, you don't like other people to know about you, if with no one else, you can certainly let down your guard with the Lord and let him know what you're really going through. I can remember as a young Christian being afraid to just tell God that I was angry, maybe even angry at him. And just to seek understanding about what was going on in my life at that moment, but to just be transparent in that moment, or even to say, you know what, God, I know that I should spend more time with you, or I should want to read my Bible more often, but maybe I just don't have the desire. And and do you know that you can you can work better off of a truth like that than you can to just go to the Lord and say, oh, precious Father, I come to you humbly today and you know, and suddenly now we putting on airs for God when he knows us and he knows how we talk amongst family. He knows how we talk amongst our friends. So come to him as transparent and honest and true to yourself as you can, because once you start to just be real with God, then you get to the deeper relationship with him. And the last tip I have for how to experience God's love is just to spend time in his word. Because let me tell you something. I don't know how it happens. And I have a scripture for this, but I don't know how it happens where you can be reading the Bible, especially the letters and all of those things for new covenant believers, those beautiful things that, that were written to us, the church. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily resonate with you in the moment. But let you be going through something. Let you be in like a dark place emotionally or just feeling lonely or confused or in fear. And we've all been there. But in those times where you were just so unsure and then if your first instinct is to go to the Lord and just to kneel at his feet and say, God, I don't know what I'm doing right now. There is something down in the well because you've been reading your word that will spring up right when you need it and will bring peace to that situation. It'll bring a solution. It'll bring an answer. It'll bring a release of the pain, the hurt, whatever you've been going through. But here's the thing, the Holy Spirit that's in you, and yes, he's in you as a believer, he has nothing to pull from. If you're not planting those seeds of the word, you know, I've heard somebody talk about it being like a well, an empty well, and I actually just use that analogy myself, but it's more accurate to say seeds. And I look at it like this. The word of God is full of seeds, just like a packet you have. Like think of your favorite fruit. Let's talk about strawberries, right? It's Valentine's Day. We love the strawberries, right? So let's say you had a packet of seeds and you wanted to grow some strawberry plants. And you wanted to make sure that those plants were, were ready to harvest in time to give your honey a basket of, of strawberries, right? Well, what would happen if in the growing season for strawberries, you just decided, I'm a Netflix and chill on this one. I know I really want those strawberries, but I think, you know, I'm having fun just doing this. And so you let months go by and you don't plant anything. What do you expect to have when, when harvest time comes? The word of God is a seed. And as you plant those seeds, they will be available to you when you need them. You won't go hungry. You will not starve spiritually because you are planting seeds and you are watering those seeds with prayer and time in the presence of the Lord. And when you need it, that harvest is going to be available to you. How do you know when it's harvest time and you've been planting seeds of the word? The harvest comes when you're in a, in, a, in a situation, when you're struggling, when you don't have an answer, when, when you have nothing in your own physical mind that can help you with your situation. That's when the Holy Spirit draws upon the word and, give, and brings it back to your remembrance. So trust the process. That's what I'll say, especially if you're new in your faith and this may be hard to understand. Trust the process. As you read and as you learn more about what God says about you, that's seed planting. That's farming, right? right? You know, we have a, a lot of scriptures agricultural, and it really does ring true that, you know, it's just like a, a planter. He's putting seeds in the ground, 
And we, we know Mark chapter four talks about the different types of soil of your heart. And we can get into that another day. But let the soil of your heart be fertile ground, right? Like don't come to God with a whole lot of doubt and skepticism because you're not going to get nothing. But be open to hear and understand. And as you do that, those seeds will go into good ground. And like I said, through prayer and, pres and spending time in his presence, that is watering that seed. And then, see, it's not up to you to make it spring forth, to make it bear fruit. That's God's job. He's the one that'll make it bear fruit. Looking at Mark chapter 4, we're going to start at verse 26. It says, the kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day he sleeps and wakes, and the seed sprouts and grows, though he knows not how. All by itself, the earth produces a crop, first the stalk, then the head, then the grain that ripens within. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he swings his sickle, and the harvest has come. So the, the thing I like about that verse is that he knows not how. And that's really what it's like for us. You know, we are we are sowing the word of God in our heart. And if you read, like I said, up above that those sets of verses, he's talking about how there's the different soils and that relates to the heart of a man or a woman. So we are planting those seeds in our heart and God brings the increase. So what I'm saying to you is just trust the process. And let me just cap this off by saying, if you want to experience the love of God, God is ready, willing, and waiting to, to show you his love, to, to bring you into that deeper fellowship, because he will not deny anyone that comes to him. So number one, be expecting, because God wants to show you how much he loves you and adores you. And when that moment comes, you'll know it. Because I know for me, it was a very real, tangible moment that changed my life. And I know it'll do the same for you. I, I feel like I need to say this, that experiencing God's love is not the warm, fuzzy tingles that you might be thinking it is. A lot of times we want some goosebumps to know that God is real. And really what we're talking about is spiritual, you know, because we're, we're three parts, spirit, a soul and a body. And sometimes we're wanting our body to experience something that really is spiritual. So what I'm saying to you, don't be surprised if when you do experience God's love, it has nothing to do with goosebumps and tingles, but it's just a knowing on the inside that he's with you and he's for you, not against you. And so I just pray for you to experience his love in, in a more impactful way. I pray for you to have a wonderful Valentine's Day. Um, and even if you don't have a boot, that's all right. You have um, love all around you in ways maybe unexpected that you didn't even think about of how much you are loved and cherished in this world. So that's all I got for you guys. Love without a limit, y'all. That's the Lord. We just thank him for his love. Yes. All right. Till next time. Bye.